I was down with no way up And I needed some help Everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free What he did for me. Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come on, let's rejoice. Oh, I like the Father, Lord, with me. Let's enjoy his name together. Lord, shout out to the church where we're here to give God praise. Total praise is what he wants of us on this special Christmas Sunday morning. Let's bow his for a word of prayer. Father, we come before you today to say thank you. Thank you for your love and your kindness and your mercy towards us, God. We love you so much this day, God. We want to say hallelujah to your name. Thank you for waking us up this morning in our right minds and the activities of our limbs. We say thank you. And right now, God, have your way in this service today, God. Let your will be done. We thank you for saving somebody today. We thank you for delivering somebody today, God. We thank you for bringing somebody through their struggle that they're going through. We thank you for the word that we shall receive on today, God. Let it be a light in somebody's path. Father, we praise you and lift you up high. In Jesus' name, we pray this prayer. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's have a word.
Praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us in this joyous time of celebration, the Advent season, where we are thanking God for his son and our savior, Jesus Christ. This Christmas has been different and difficult for some people because of the struggles they've been going through. But right now, I need you to know that 
God is still in control. And no matter what's going on in your life, there's a blessing because God has a plan for you. I, it's something I was comforting someone who lost a loved one. And they were excited because they were telling me, I'm going to stand on the word of God. And then he said something very profound. That's really all we got. Right, Rev? And I said, right. That's what I'm telling you. It may be all we got, but please don't look at it like that. Understand it's enough no matter what it is because we have the word of God. Go with me. I have a, I have a scripture today that I think will emphasize and bring you to a place of contentment. When you look at what God has done for you and your family this Christmas season, will you go with me to Luke's gospel, chapter 20, chapter 2, verse 20, 25. We'll start at verse 25. Luke chapter 2. I know someone's saying he's going into the Christmas story. No, Luke chapter 2, verse 25. That's where we're going to begin reading. I'll probably, I'm going to read down... Uh, 10 verses. Luke 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. And for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Come on, let's pray. Father God, I ask you to bless the teaching, preaching of your word today. Bless someone listening, Lord, to let them know that a word in due season, oh, how good it is. But I ask that you would... Also, Lord, take me out of the way. Move me out of the equation. Allow your spirit to come and bless your people. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. One of the most exciting action movie franchises that has ever been created, and I'm an action movie junkie, is the James Bond series. Now, I know Sean Connery, who recently passed away, was the first and most famous Bond, but I am partial to the Pierce Brosnan series or the Pierce Brosnan Bond movies. But no matter who you like, what makes this movie franchise so box office friendly and so exciting is the fact that it always opens up with an opening action scene where James Bond is in an impossible situation that it seems like there's no way for him to get out of it, but he gets out of it. And it always brings you in because you're sitting there and you see James Bond uh, falling out of an airplane thousands of feet in the air with no parachute. This is the beginning of the movie where you see him tied into a room, tied in a chair in a room with a bomb going off and with time running down. But you're sitting there on the edge of your seat. But there's one thing you realize as you're going through this, and that is that somehow it's inevitable, it's an eventuality that James Bond is going to escape and make the rest of that movie. That's what happens with all 
action guy, all good guys and all heroes, somehow they find their way that they get out of the worst situation there is. Sylvester Stallone is Rambo, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I was so delighted when they had one of our first, you know, black icons that was a hero, Sidney Poitier. And I'm talking about the movie In the Heat of the Night. Uh, Real time in the 60s, Sidney Poitier played Mr. Tibbs. And in the movie, there was one scene that lets you know how heroic and that Sidney Poitier was in charge. But in the Jim Crow South in the 60s, there was a white man who slapped Sidney Poitier, excuse me, Mr. Tibbs, in the face, and he slapped him back. (laughs) When it happened, it was called the slap that was heard around the world. And the white guy said this, there was a time I could have had you shot for doing that. And Sidney Poitier did his you know, signature, pulled his coat and pimped right out. What? Tell me that was not cool. He was a hero. And then, of course, when you see Denzel in, Denzel in the equalizer and he texts his watch and he, you know, clicks off how much time it's going to take for him to kick some bad guy. But, and, but the, the record-breaking, Oscar-winning Black Panther movie brought us Chadwick Boseman. Wow. He was becoming a legend even at his young age. But Chadwick Bowman, do you know Black Panther was the first Marvel Cinematic Movie to win? A lot of them were nominated for Oscars. It won three Oscars, which even immortalized Chadwick Boseman even more. But all these heroes have one thing in common with us as believers. And here it is. That is no matter what situation we're going to get into, no matter what circumstances we're facing this morning, no matter how deep you're in, no matter how bad the enemy is on you, no matter how approachable, no matter how unbearable your situation, I have great news for you. Here is something you can take to the bank that God, it's inevitable, it's an eventuality that you're going to get out. Here is what I want you to know, and here's the title of my message. I did not forget. For as long as the spirit of the Lord will allow, I'm going to speak from this thought. Calm down. It's just a matter of time. That's what it is. All these heroes had one thing in common with God, and that is that God's going to get you out. All you have to do, if you can believe long enough, if you can stay strong long enough, it's just a matter of time before God gets you out and blesses you and brings you what you desire. And I know somebody knows what I'm talking about because you're standing here now as a living witness, and you had dug a hole, you had been in a situation, you don't know how you got out of it, but think back. As time went by, God was working his plan. God was getting you out. I want to help somebody this morning. I want you to know that if you understand who you are and whose you are, don't worry how bad this pandemic is. Don't worry how bad your money look, how bad your situation look. Somebody ought to say with me, it's just a matter of time. If you give God enough time, he can get you out of it any situation because that's the kind of God that we serve. Why would you say that, Reverend? If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, look what the Bible says. It supports the fact that it's a matter of time. It's an eventuality. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says, all the promises of God are yes and in him amen as we give glory to God as is spoken through us, that all the promises of God are yes and amen in him. If you go to the NIV, it breaks that down and says, every promise God has made is going to come to pass because of what Christ has done, and it brings glory to God as we say yes and amen. You know what that means? It means that if I can say amen, amen just means I confirm. If God say he's a healer, I just say amen. If God say he's a deliverer, I'm going to not have doubt. I'm going to walk around and say amen. I know he's a deliverer. Whatever it is, I believe that all the promises in God are yes. Somebody said, don't God say no? I didn't say God never says no to some stuff. We might be asking him that we don't need. I said, eventually, no matter what happens, God has a plan to get you out. It's just a matter of time. You don't believe me? You ought to hear what Job said. When you, when you look at the Bible... Excuse me, you ought to hear Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And Paul was talking to the church at Philippi, and he said these words. He says, he, 
Verse 6, who has begun a good work in you will work it until the day of Jesus Christ. Understand something. What Paul said is God finishes what he starts. (laughs) Isn't that something? You just got to make sure you're still around to capitalize, to benefit from God getting you out. God finishes what he starts. He has begun a good work in you. God said, if you don't stop, I won't stop. If you don't stop praying, if you don't stop believing, if you don't stop praising, if you don't let yourself get so far down, God said, I've begun a good work and I got a plan to get you all the way out. That's a shout for somebody. God is working even when you're not working to get you out of your situation because that's the kind of God that we serve. So we need to understand the good news is every promise is yes. God is going to get us out. But then Apostle Paul found himself and his uh, uh, companions, they were on a missionary journey and they were talking to the church at Corinth. And in that second chapter, uh, verse 10, we find second Corinthians chapter one, verse 10, we find these words where Paul said he gave us a threefold understanding of the power of God. Here's what he said. He said, I want you to know that God has delivered us from a dangerous peril and he will deliver us again. Our hope is on him because he can deliver us. And look what Paul said. He gave us a threefold deliverance that God will continually deliver us. He said he has delivered us from deadly perils. He can deliver us again. Can I stop there and tell somebody if God delivered you? He can deliver you again. Can I tell you one more time? No matter what happens, if God delivered you once, he can deliver you. God won't run out of power. God's able to deliver you because that's the kind of stuff. So if God healed you once, don't say I've been healed and I can't get another healing. No, God is saying if I del- if I delivered you once, I can deliver you again. Threefold deliverance we always have in God covers all our bases. He has delivered. You got a witness. He will deliver. You got a witness and he can deliver again. He healed us in the past. He healed us right now and he'll he'll heal us forever. That's the kind of God that we serve. It's a God that lets us know whatever we need he has. It's just a matter of time. Christmas is a day where we understand uh, the Advent season. You know what that means, right? The Advent means God is on the way. The Messiah is coming. Do you know what you need to think about every time you get into a crisis? I'm not here alone. God is on the way. He's here with me. And when you understand that you're not alone and God is on the way, it means that you have a reason to rejoice because God always finishes his promises. Our text is letting us know. We're looking at Simeon's song in our text, but there were two people standing in the temple At the time when Christ was brought to the temple by his father, Joseph, and his mother, Mary, and both of them had been waiting on the Lord. And and Simeon and Anna the prophetess, both of them gave testimony that if you trust God long enough, if you wait on God long enough, he's going to bless you and bring you through. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. The first verse of our text, because we're going to concentrate on Simeon. Uh, I, I would like to look at Anna too, but Simeon has so much in print, so many biblical principles in what he's saying that we need to understand them. It is a powerful testimony to a salient foundational principle in the word of God. Understand when I use the word salient, I'm not using big words. I'm telling you, it's one that can't be broken. It's something that cannot be taken away once God said it. Simeon's song in that first verse, it said there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, the same man was just and devout, and as he was just and devout, he was waiting on the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was with him. The second verse says, and the Holy Ghost had promised to him that he should not see death until Jesus until he's seen the Messiah. So he shouldn't die until after he's seen the Messiah. His only obligation was to wait. God said it's a matter of time. What am I telling you this for? It's because we think stuff is hopeless. We get to the point where we think that this moment that we're in right now is the only moment. No, that's the moment you got to use the word of God to say, if I can stand this, my God is on the way with his deliverance. That's what Christmas represents, that deliverance of God. 
I know this is Sunday after Christmas, but the Advent covers us to say Jesus has come. And that's what we're celebrating because the fact that Jesus had come. The key word in that verse was he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. We don't like to wait. We don't like to wait because we don't understand waiting. Uh, we understand waiting, but we just know waiting is a pain. And, and, but everybody knows that we have to wait. And if it's something worth waiting for, we will wait for it. As a matter of fact, you've heard the word that uh, anything worth having is worth waiting for. I don't know about that, but people act like they've been, you know, that we've been uh, made uh, selfish or spoiled by the world we live in now. Like it's such a fast paced world. No, it's not. Can I tell you something? Fast food's not fast. You ever got stuck in a line of Wendy's? You ever got stuck in a line of McDonald's? Fast food ain't all that fast. Technology is not that fast. Go take one of your apparatus to be repaired. They ain't, they're not going to just take it and give it back to you. You're going to have to make an appointment. So don't let anybody fool you. Here is what we know. Waiting is a part of life. But waiting on God is a whole nother animal. Because when you wait on God, you know you're waiting because it's worth the wait. And what God brings back to you is going to bless you. So we have to understand the power of waiting if it's worth waiting on. Not long ago, uh, my wife and I took a break during this pandemic from all this videoing and, and all the work we're doing now to hold the churches together. And we went to Lancaster. We're just going to take a break. We'll have a good time just for a few days. And the next morning we got up to have breakfast. And if we got to have breakfast, oh, I said, I want to have my coffee. So we got our GPS together. We put it in the GPS, and we found a Dunkin's Donuts. That's where she get her coffee, Dunkin' Donuts. We went to Dunkin' Donuts without an exaggeration. I had to ride around three or four times just to find. The, there was a long line going in there. I said to her, let's go next door to the Wawa. She said, I want my coffee. I said, what do you want me to do? She said, get in the line. I turned the car around. I got in the line. I told you I wanted to have a good time that weekend. We got in the line, and we waited, and I was shocked. Here's the part that got me. I was shocked to see how many other people other cars lined up behind us. Dunkin' Donuts, it, there was a line back out to the highway. Why? Because whatever people thought, that's worth me having. I want my coffee from Dunkin' Donuts. And don't act like that's strange to you because some of you women out there know if you can't get your hair done by the hairdresser you go to, you will not get your hair done. You'll wait until you can make an appointment. Somebody give me amen. To the person you want. When I used to have hair, I'll say that again. When I used to go to barbershop, get a fresh cut, you didn't just jump in anybody's chair. You had to wait till your barber was there. You don't just take your car to any mechanic. All I'm telling you is waiting is not bad if it's something worth waiting for. Last one, let me tell you this. I was sitting online trying to get my health insurance together. Because I had been calling and calling and calling. And so I was on the phone again. And all of us have heard this. All of us, have, you, you can probably mim mimic this with me. But I got onto the phone and someone said, um, all of our representatives are busy helping other clients. Uh, we will be with you in a moment. Your wait time is 30 minutes. Or you can try your call later. I was so mad. Bam, I put that phone on speaker and said, I'm going to sit here till I get my health insurance worked out. You know why? Because waiting is something that brings us back to something we want. I'm going to do this and then I'm going to go straight into what I want you to understand the power of waiting and why it's not a bad thing when we're waiting on God because we always get a reward. David said in Psalms 27, verses 13 and 14, I want you to look this up because this blesses me when David said, I would have fainted. Lest I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Wait, I say on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say. Listen to what David said. Wait on the Lord. He will strengthen thine heart. I would have fainted. The first lesson we learn about waiting is don't faint while you're waiting. God is never going to pull back his power. As a matter of fact, David said, God's going to strengthen you while you're waiting. Isn't that a blessing? It's opposite of what we're taught. God will strengthen us while we wait on the Lord. I love the fact that when I'm waiting on God, 
and I wait with a contentment and I wait understanding who God is, I get a blessing. The second thing we need to understand is I can wait because watch this. You have an appointment to get your blessing. I, I, I know I, I know that sounds a little strange, but I need you to hear me. God actually put your name on the calendar today. I'm going to bless James. Now, I'm over here thinking I want my blessing now. But God is saying I have an appointment All I got to do is stand strong. You want to see somebody who stood strong while they're waiting on their appointment? You ought to go to Job chapter 14, verse 14, and listen to Job as he sat with boils on his body and as he sat, had lost everything, as he sat there with his health dissipating and his mind not being able to hold on to reality and people walking out on him and his best friends talking about him. He said, watch this, I love Job. He said that uh, I will wait. Until my change comes. Here's how he starts that verse. He said, if a man dies, will he live again? All my appointed days, I will wait till my change comes. That's powerful, y'all. Understand what God said. Wait all your appointed days. Man, here's what he's saying. Nobody can cut off the days God has appointed you life. God said, I have the strength to appoint a life over you. That's why you haven't gone under yet. That's why you haven't lost yet. You should have been down. Tell the truth. You should have lost a long time ago. But because God said, I appointed you to get out of that. Job said, you got an appointment. Somebody ought to shout right now. Did I got an appointment with my next blessing? I'm going to hang in there until my appointment comes. And of course, Isaiah 40 is one we all know. Uh, Isaiah Wrote the song of songs. Everybody, everybody can quote this. Even unsaved people know this. They that wait on the Lord, Isaiah 40, verse 31, shall renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God said, if you wait on me, you will renew your strength and you will become better. Listen to me as I talk about Simeon. It's just a matter of time. Here's a word I want to lighten your load with. Nothing else you have to do but stand there and trust in your mind that it's a matter of time. Simeon is going to teach us how to wait contently. No, I scratched that. How to wait and celebrate. While somebody says celebrate, you can celebrate while you're waiting because you know whatever God has is going to come back and it's going to bless you. So I want us to do three things. You know, I like to tell you where I'm going. First, we're going to talk about how to celebrate with contentment. How do I celebrate while I'm waiting, knowing it's a matter of time? How do I celebrate with him? Then we're going to celebrate his coming. And after we celebrate his coming, we're going to celebrate, watch this, our confidence. Celebrate Contentment. Celebrate his coming. Celebrate our confidence. Let's talk about it. You know the text because this is a Christmas story. But I need to take you behind the story because we act like Bible characters didn't breathe, eat, and think like us. Simeon was an older man who was waiting on the consolation of Israel, or waiting on a blessing so his people could be empowered or his people could be given back the favor of God. And here is how this book opens up. This second chapter is full. It's a powerful chapter. I just want to take you down so you can meet Simeon. First, it opens up in this text with the understanding of a decree by uh, Caesar Augustus who said everyone must go back to their hometown in order to meet the census. He had said that there was going to be a census, and the census was for everyone to be taxed for Roman purposes. So wherever town you grew up in, you had to go back. That's why you see the story where Mary and Joseph, Joseph and a pregnant Mary are on a donkey going back to Galilee, which is also Nazareth. They were going to Gal- Nazareth, which is in Galilee, and you see the story where they got there. This chapter covers Jesus' birth to his boyhood. Watch what happens next. Then the angels appear, right, telling them that um, unto you is born in the city of David a, a, a Savior who is Christ the Lord, peace on earth, goodwill to men. So we see the birth of Jesus through the eyes of Joseph's gene- genealogy. In the book of Matthew, it's from 
Mary's genealogy, but this side is from Joseph's genealogy. So we see the birth, how Joseph is a legitimate heir scripturally to be, to be Jesus' father. And then it says the shepherds heard the angels singing. They decided to go see Jesus. Then after the shepherds saw Jesus, bowed down, they went and told everybody else about Jesus. And then it says when Jesus was eight weeks old, they took him to the temple so that he could meet the ceremony of purification and get circumcised, as was the law of Moses. And when he arrived, stay with me, they're sitting against a wall contented was Simeon. The prophet. Simeon. The Bible doesn't tell us how old he is, but we know he's an old man. By the way, they said he was waiting on the consolation of Israel. Simeon was sitting there waiting on God. And because he was sitting there waiting, the Bible tells us that he had been, he heard from God who said he wasn't going to die until he saw the Messiah and he took God at his word. So we know he was Powerful and contented in his waiting, first of all, because he had been waiting so many years. Some of us can't wait on God. We missed our blessing because you won't stop and wait. I'm telling somebody right now, you are about to give up before you heard me, but you need to stop and wait. Your appointment has been set, and God is coming. It's just a matter of time. All you have to do is wait, and Simeon was waiting on God, and we know that because he had a strong relationship with God because he trusted in the promise and the voice that God had. He was a godly man who was contented. You know what the Bible says? Godliness with contentment brings great results. Godliness, what it means is God loves to bless those who know he's able and he's worthy. You can't sit around being schizophrenic. You can't sit around trusting God one minute, not trusting him the next minute, uh, uh, blessing, thanking him when he's blessing you and not thanking him when he's not blessing you. God said, here's what you need to understand. I show myself strong to those who know I'm able and those who know I'm worthy, and you can't count your circumstance. Somebody said, what you're saying doesn't add up with how I'm living, but you need to understand God doesn't care about the circumstances. You care about the circumstances. God just says, wait on me and trust me and I'll get you out. How do I know? I think about the Apostle Paul and Silas locked in a Philippian jail. And the Bible says, can you see them sitting in there? Shackles on their hands, shackles on their feet. And they're singing praises to God. And the Bible said they probably were just, you know, going over the scriptures and talking about what they had done. They never got negative talking about the scriptures. They never started complaining. As a matter of fact, the Bible says at midnight, do you know the significance of midnight? The significance of midnight is the fact that it's the darkest time in your life. Some of you have not learned praise is for dark times. I just said something. Praise is when you can't see any other way out. Praise is when you are in a situation that it looks like the doors are closing, everything's being cut off. But if you can be a praiser, said at midnight, Paul and Silas sang praises to the Lord in that Philippian jail. You know, the story started shaking in an earthquake and they were set free. If you can praise God at midnight. I think about Daniel. Who was so in love with God. That when Nebuchadnezzar said, you can't pray anymore openly. He refused to miss his prayer time. He knew he was going to be thrown into the lion's den. But he refused to miss his prayer time. And here is Daniel opening his windows so he could let his father know, I'm not ashamed of you. Those are the people God bless. When it looked like he's sinking, I'm not ashamed of you. And he prayed. And the Bible said he was thrown into the lion's den. And every picture you see of Daniel in the lion's den, he's sitting there celebrating his contentment. And God closes the lion's mouth. And then finally, I see Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus. John chapter 11. The Bible said Jesus wept. And after he cried, he walked over to them in that 41st verse. And he said, um, y'all roll away the stone. And when they were taking the stone away, stay with me. When they were taking the stone away, the Bible says he looked up to heaven and said, Father, I know you always hear me. 
Verse 42, I thank you for hearing me. And when he looked, he said, but for the sake of those who are standing by so they know that you sent me, I need you to answer me. He was so contented that God was going to do it. In front of that crowd, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And the blessing was Lazarus came out. Godliness with contentment. We need to have the kind of contentment that Jesus had. Can I tell you that somebody here listening now, the only problem you have is because you can't be contented with the God that you're serving. You missed some blessings because God just wanted you to relax and be contented, but you missed your blessing. Watch this. There was a man who was jealous of his neighbors because his neighbors had more luxurious houses than he did. So he decided to put his house up for sale. He called a real estate company and he put his house up for sale. He was going to buy him a more impressive house. So he put the house on the market. And then after that, he actually got on the web and searching around real estate companies. He saw a house that looked exactly like the house he wanted to have. And when he saw the house he wanted to have, he called up and said, uh, I'm interested in the house I just saw on your website. And the man said, well, describe the house. He started describing the house. And then the realtor said, well, who is this? And he gave him his name. He said, sir, that's your house that you were trying to sell. Do you understand me? Some of you have the power you need right now. You're just not contented. You don't need another new prayer. You don't need another new praise. You need to stick with what you've been doing. You need to know that the God you serve right now is enough. But if you're not contented, you won't know he's enough. Second reason Simeon was contented was because it said he was from Jerusalem. Don't miss that. He was from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a city that was happening. Jerusalem was where? The sacrifices were. Jerusalem was where the temple was. Jerusalem was the place where he was able to see Jewish citizens standing up against the tyranny of Rome. Jerusalem was the place where he saw the power of the sacrifices. He heard the prophecies. He understood. He was sitting against that wall every day, reinforcing, hearing himself, knowing that God was real. And the question is, why can't we feel the same way? Jerusalem is synonymous or symbolic with the church. Many of us have been in church all your life. And in church, if you can remember when we were in church, you've seen the spirit of God raise up. You've seen people running around anointed. You've seen some healings. You've seen some blessings. You saw God show up to the point of tears. You saw God show up not only in your church. He's shown up in you. You've seen God show up in your house. You've seen God take people who was hopeless, had no way out, and he blessed them. You know situations right now, I don't have to tell you, that are miraculous situations. If you could think back in your mind, you know that it was God. And yet, we won't have the contentment to know that we have evidence. All I'm saying is Simeon had enough evidence to wait contently. You've seen God bless other people. you got enough evidence to wait contently. And if you can't think about how God blessed anybody else, think about how God blessed you. Look at how he kept you. Look at how he brought you through a tumultuous situation. I know i got to stop yelling right now, but look at all the things God has done in your life. Sometimes it, it gets me that people can't see. You got enough evidence not to be sitting there crying. You got enough evidence not to sit there hopeless. And the evidence is looking you right in the face. Because that's the kind of God we serve. Come on, if you could testify, you could tell us some miraculous stuff right now. But you have to understand that's what Jerusalem, he was in Jerusalem. His name was Simeon, which the word Simeon means he heard from God. Same thing you have heard from God. Not only was he in Jerusalem and he had heard from God and he had seen what God had done. You need to understand that when he lived there, he celebrated because he was a righteous man. The Bible says he was just and devout. OK, watch this. Just means. Other people. This is important. Just is not because you say you just just means other people can see God in you. It means other people know God's in you. Devout means I know God is watching what I do. So a person who is just and devout 
walks around making sure that they are holding up the bloodstained banner. They're doing what God said. They want other people to know God is gentle. God is caring. God will supply their needs, and God uses us. That's how we get justified or righteous. But when we're devout, it means we're sticking to that because we believe that my God is watching, and it's a true part of us. When you're a devout person, it means that's who you are through and through. I am sorry to say with the next example I give you, many times we slip. Many times we slip. I went out the other morning for my walk run that I normally take, and I left late. So I was a little irritated. And I always go out, I have my mask with me, and I carry my phone. In my phone, I have a little compartment there where I put about 2 or $3. You never want to be out there without a little money because sometimes I stop to get water because it's a long walk and a long run that I'm doing. So this day, I stopped to the Wild Wild to get some water. I got my little $3. I think I had three, paid for the water, still had $2 and some change. While I was in there, I saw the guy look friendly. We spoke to each other like you always do. I said, hey to him. He said, hey, what's up? And then I paid for my stuff. Well, when I walked outside the Wawa, he was standing outside the door. And as I was walking away, I told you I was irritated, right? He said, yo, yo, bruh, can you help me out? I have my mask on. I turned around. I said, I'm thinking... I could give him this $2, but I, I'm, 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 I'm in a hurry. I'm already late. I said, well, yeah, no, no, no. I, you see, I, I just, I'm walking. I'm out doing my exercise right now. Um, I just got my water, and, and I'm on my way. He said, okay. He said, well, man, thanks anyway. I turned around. Don't mention it. When I said don't mention it, he said, Reverend Duncans. And I turned around. And he said, I knew I recognized that voice. And when I saw him, here I am thinking, I don't know what I was thinking. I wasn't thinking God. Because here's what happened. He pointed to his car. He said, Rev, I'm on my way to a job interview. I only got a little bit of gas. I'm not going to make it. I'm just waiting on somebody. Hopefully I can get 2 or $3, just enough to get me over to the interview. My wife's going to meet me over there, and I'll be okay. I felt so bad. I never told him I didn't have any money, but I act like I didn't have any money. But I turned around and gave him the $2. And as I walked away... Why does God do this? As I walked away, the Spirit of God said to me so clearly, why did he have to call your name and use your title before you gave him any money? What, why, why can't you treat him like I treat you? God said, I need you to listen with more compassion. Here, here's what I'm trying to tell you. You can't really be just if it's just about you. God always says the reality of real righteousness is how we treat other people. After I gave him the money, I want to tell you, and this is, this is the crazy stuff, and we all know it. After I gave him the money, I walked, and there was a whole different anointing on my walk because I, I felt bad, I repented, but then I felt good because that's the tap into God. I know they tell you about giving and, you know, all the church wanted your money. No, when you give and you see the church blessing somebody to eat and somebody has clothing and you can go to your cupboard and have food in your cupboard, you know then that you're living the way God wants you to live. Just. The next part of the text is easy. said he's waiting on the consolation of Israel. The word consolation, we, we always say a consolation prize, but a consolation is now I can sit back contently. I'm living just, I'm living devout. I sit back contently and I know my promise is on the way. The word consolation means I'm waiting on God to rescue me. I know God can rescue me because I rescued somebody else. God can rescue. And finally, it said the Holy Ghost told him he wouldn't die. I'm, going, I'm, I'm quickly, we're not going to take much longer, but I need you to hear this. So he was celebrating contentment because the Holy Ghost told him he would not die till he saw the Savior. He stood on the promise of God that he would not die. You know, I like what he said. The Holy Ghost told me. Uh, many of us, in this new era of Christianity, we don't like to talk about what God said to us 
unless we're bragging about it or you coming to me telling me what God said for you to tell me. That's not what this is supposed to be about. That's not what this text says. This text says God had told him. See, this is some old school church here. This is the kind that, you know, when I was growing up in church and I used to watch the old folk who looked like they didn't have nothing, coming to church faithfully every week, serving God like they were the richest people on the earth, and you're sitting there going, why in the world are you worshiping like everything okay? Why are you content with where you are? Because they would say some words that said, God done told me. God told me. There it is. God told me. See, we're worried about somebody co-signing what God said. We're worried about somebody agreeing with us. So we got to run around and tell everybody what God said. God said, no, some secret you ought to keep in your own heart. They're the ones that burn that midnight oil with you. They're the ones when your spouse is asleep and you're laying in the pillow and the devil attacks where you can say, but God done told me. They're the ones when the doctor gives you bad news. You can look around and say, but God done told me. I didn't tell nobody else, but God telling me was good enough, and I kept that secret in my heart. And I know I trusted him, so I'm content. Saying that old song, you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. Come on, let's move through this. Not only did he celebrate his contentment, he celebrated his coming. The Bible says he was led by the Spirit to the temple. Let me quickly tell you what that means. Led by the Spirit to the temple. This was not a miracle. That's our problem. We think when somebody says they're led by the Spirit, spirit. that's why we like to raise people up on a pedestal. Because they say, I've been led by the Spirit. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, if you're not led by the Spirit, you're not even a son of God. I didn't say that. Romans 8, 14 says, as many as are led by the Spirit are the children of God. If you're not led by the Spirit, you are none of his. Many of us have lost our celebration of his coming because we're not being led by him. What, what does it mean to celebrate his coming? He went to the temple, talking about Simeon. The Spirit led him there. He saw the baby Jesus, walked up to Mary and Joseph, took the baby out of his hands, held the baby up, and blessed God. But he was led by the Spirit. Understand something. This is how God blesses us. We got to stop and listen. So do you know right now, somebody out there, God was already trying to bless you. You didn't slow down and listen. You didn't stop and say, speak to me, God. God saying, man, when we you know what happens to us, we wait until we're so overwhelmed we're so jacked up, fear everywhere, anxiety everywhere. Now we want to listen. I want to hear God. God said, no, celebrate the fact that I came into your life and I led you to me. You know, one of the greatest promises there is that God chose me. Hallelujah. So if he led me to him, I can be content. Look what he did. He blessed God. That means he was grateful for what God had given him. Whenever you're stuck, and I'm closing, whenever you're stuck, you got to be grateful. Grateful is not thanking God for the things I get. It's thank, not thanking God for the things I want, but thanking God for the things that he gives me. I got to be grateful for what I already have. Give me five minutes. I got to be ready for what I already have. Grateful means that I thank God for the things because he is worthy. I don't thank him for things. I thank him just because he's God. I'm grateful. See, what happened when Simeon finally saw the promise, he blessed God. Blessing God just means I was grateful that God gave it to me. Some of us are so selfish that we act like we're supposed to get the things that we have. And the selfishness is making us be ungrateful because when it doesn't come the way we want it, now we won't thank God until God does a breakthrough. And God is saying, no, be thankful. You know what I did? I already provided for you. Be thankful. I protected you. Be thankful. Thank God for the stuff, not the stuff you want, but the stuff he already does. Uh, ten lepers were healed. 
illustrate my point. All of them. Nine never came back. One came back. The nine did what we do. They were so enamored with the healing of who they were now, they forgot to go back and give thanks. If you got a roof, give thanks. Uh, you notice my house, I walk around all the time. No, every day you get up, give thanks for that roof. When your car starts, give thanks for that car. When, when you got food in your cover, give, I don't care what it is, give thanks for that stuff. Because that's what God wants us to do. And Simeon, bless God, gave thanks. Which is how we find ourselves when God blesses us. Because stuff will kill us. And somebody's not even sensitive to what I'm saying because the stuff and your desire for stuff has already drained you of gratitude. A man talked about one day seeing an eagle, a bald eagle flying around in a wild circle. And as he watched, the circle got smaller and smaller. And then out of nowhere, this eagle zoomed down with jet speed and picked up this weasel and was flying off with the weasel. But as soon as the weasel got in his claws, he began to scratch at the breast of the eagle and bite and tear flesh and break bone. The man watched. It wasn't too far away for the eagle fell out the sky and the weasel ran on about its day. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Just because you want something doesn't mean it's good for you. And the stuff you want takes your mind off God and it's killing you. Quit being sad over the stuff you want and rejoice over the stuff God gave you. Let's look at our last point. Celebrate our contentment. Celebrate his coming because what Simeon said is I want to shout loudly the reason I don't worry is he's already come he's here hallelujah which takes us to the last point celebrate our confidence celebrate our confidence here's what our confidence says the Bible said Joseph and Mary marveled at the thing Simeon said about the baby Jesus and all of a sudden Simeon told her, well, you need to understand this child is for the rising and falling of many in Israel. And Mary, that an arrow is going to pierce your heart. Isn't it something how we want all of our service to God to be about this good, good? He said, no, Mary, even carrying the Messiah, there's going to be ups and downs as this plan of redemption kicks in. But the Bible says when Simeon ended, he talked about not only being the light of the Gentile. He said many things shall be revealed in our hearts by the coming of Jesus. Here's my confidence. Unto us is born a Savior. Unto us a child is given. Here's why I can celebrate contently. Here's why I can celebrate his coming. Here's why I can celebrate with confidence because you really can't understand Christmas without Easter I know I'm messing people up but Christmas celebrate his coming Easter tell us that he was victorious for why he came and that's what Simeon was prophesying this child is going to carry out the plan rise and fall Peter rose above Judas fell. Some of us in here weren't worthy, but we rose up. Others fell. My supreme reason for being able to celebrate the worst situation in my life is because Jesus came, fulfilled the plan, and now with Simeon, I know my deliverance, because he already worked it out, is just When you start looking at your deliverance that way, it'll change the fear in your heart and the struggle you go through. Can I say it to you again and you, you repeat it back to me? Just convince yourself. What I need is just a matter of time. If you enjoyed that message, 
and I hope you take away the points of the message. When you leave here, celebrate your content. I'm content with God. Celebrate his coming. He came for me. He chose me. And I'm going to celebrate because I know I'm grateful for what he did. And then my confidence is it's been prophesied that he would gain the victory and give it to us. If you're not saved today, pray this prayer with me. Come on. This, this, don't let this year go out and all this calamity you see without accepting Jesus as your Savior. Say these words. Say, Lord God, I thank you for being born and coming to earth for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and then raising up again with all power in your hand. And Lord, I confess now that I need you. I believe in my heart you did it for me. Because I believe it, say these words, I am saved. Say these words, Jesus is Lord. Well, God bless you today. Hope this word has blessed you. Come on, write us back, chat. I want you to go to our website. We're still trying to build our YouTube channel. Please go in and subscribe. Uh, Shiloh Praise Church, hashtag SBC Praise Church. And you'll go in there, subscribe, and go back and look at some of the exciting messages. Thank you for joining us. And please tune into our Bible study. We're doing a great series there on depression. So God bless you during this Christmas season. And I hope you enjoyed the message. Have a blessed day. Right after this service. You can go pray and get the blessings of the Lord. Amen. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down with no way up and I needed some help. Everybody. Breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.